enjoy a seat at the table and good company where great conversations and meaningful discussions happen. Welcome to And Good Company. I'm Sarah Fiedelholtz. We all know a great dinner party isn't really about the food. It's about the people seated around the table engaging in lively discussions. And Good Company creates a way to capture smart and important conversations as they happen. I am pleased to again be in the company of Dr. Jeff Webb, a professor of American history at Huntington University. Welcome back. Oh, it's great to be here. Thank you. So um, we are going to talk about the, you do a series of um, audio lectures. Um, and you did one on Ben Franklin, and it's called Made in America. And, but before we talk about Ben Franklin and his experiences, I can't not because you are a history professor. So I have to ask you a little bit about this whole idea of cancel culture mm -hmm. and now even outlaw culture and how everybody's poor Dr. Seuss. <laughs> so I mean, in the realm of history and the trying to rewrite our history or cancel our history, I mean, does it work? Is it something that concerns you? Is it something we should all be worried about? Uh, well, I don't know about that second part, but historically, um, you know, there's ample number of, um, you know, groups in American society that had a sort of a cancel culture mindset. You think of the Puritans, you know, like, don't do this, don't do that. Um, so it, it, it's sort of, you can find sort of examples in the 19th and early 20th century of uh, people saying, like, this particular kind of behavior is, you know, beyond the bounds or it's, it's, uh, it's produced so much social... Um, right evil that it's time for it to end. Like prohibition would be sort of like the big, you know, cancel culture. <laughs> We're going to cancel alcohol, you know. Right. Of course, uh, it doesn't really work um, with that kind of coercion. I think the current sort of m maybe mood that we're in is there's a cancel culture of the right and a cancel culture of the left. And they, um, they seem to be sort of, uh, you know, positioning themselves you know, uh, in terms of like where the boundary of acceptable sort of mm -hmm. behavior is. And much of it is, you know, cancel culture that's um, being done by, you know, like corporations maybe, uh, media companies. Um, think of the Dr. Seuss, I think it was the, the family foundation well, yeah, that yeah. pulled the And it really, times. I mean, yes, the drawing, I mean, it was a, it was a Chinese boy yeah. who, and they, how they had him draw oh, and yeah. he says a Chinese boy eats with sticks. <laughs> but I mean, it wasn't, I mean, yes, it was a stereotype, but it, I wouldn't say it was so offensive. And maybe, maybe as a teacher, you could use that as a teaching moment mm -hmm. to say, you know, we don't call them Chinese; they're Asians. And um, well, that would be an opportunity to sort of teach your students that attitudes and values change, right. change as over opposed time. to just yeah. getting rid of it. Yeah. But do you think that it really works when we try to like take down monuments or rewrite? You know, especially our former president with really the rewriting of saying that, pointing out all these flaws or. Uh, issues of racism and um, in the American history and in our so it is anti-American. Do you think that it really works? Um, do you really think that you can really cancel things? Well, uh, possibly not. I, uh, it, you know, again, I um, don't necessarily have a fully sort of well-formed opinion about that, right. it, other than just being a, an interested and engaged American citizen in the present. But um, I do know that there's some things in our DNA that as Americans that sort of you know, would predispose us maybe mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, these kind of like total, total prohibitions, you know, we're gonna boycott this. Right. You know, we right. boycotted uh, British goods in the revolution, right. and I think those boycotts. I think it's, it's with anything, the, we have a tendency, yeah. the pendulum just to swing yeah. so far out, and then we have to slowly bring it back. But I just was yeah, wondering. I do think the internet sort of like sensitized us maybe in a little bit more um, acute way to, mm -hmm. This kind of boundary drawing and what's acceptable mm -hmm. behavior, and this is this is a kind of unacceptable stereotype, or this is an unacceptable racial remark, mm -hmm. um, and so that kind of facilitates perhaps maybe the, the ever present. Mm -hmm. um, I just thought it would be interesting from someone who's yeah. an academic who spends uh -huh. their life looking at our lives in the rearview mirror and yeah. capturing history and what it means and the importance of it. So I think um, you know I think your the importance of obviously you believe in the importance of history and understanding <laughs> yeah. it. So, um, so you've done a series of these uh, lecture types of talks. So you've done uh, Theodore Roosevelt, Franklin um, Delano Roosevelt, 
and Benjamin Franklin. Mm -hmm. So how, why Ben Franklin? Like, how do you decide that he was worthy of your time and efforts to create a 10-part uh, audio <laughs> lecture series? Uh, well, it, it sort of grows out of your um, um, teaching and professional interests. And so I spent a lot of time with Franklin in my classes and uh, became kind of comfortable with being able to say some things about him and his life and his legacy in the United States. Um, but uh, he's, I think it's timely as well. I mean, mm -hmm. he's a sort of, uh, you know, a quintessential American in many ways. And so there was uh, sort of an opportunity to really kind of talk about the importance of um, Benjamin Franklin, you know, in the 18th century context, but also for, you know, Americans who uh, lived downriver from those events. I mean, he's obviously really important in the history of science. He's really important in the um, independence movement and uh, creating the new republic. But uh, what I discovered is that he also, you know, ought to be seen as pioneering a certain outlook that that becomes recognizably American in the mm -hmm. 19th and 20th century. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so there were some opportunities there to really explore you know, who we are as Americans mm -hmm. and then perhaps maybe what kind of contribution a figure like Benjamin Franklin right. might have made to that. So, and we do have a tendency also, also in some ways, and I think it's why with all these monuments we put up, we mm -hmm. sort of uh, mythologize or uh, create this perfection around some uh, people, and especially in our past. So let's talk a little bit about Ben Franklin and who he was and, you know. Well, I'm glad, he, you, I'm glad you started the question that way because he would have been somewhat pleased, I suppose, that we're talking about like the mythologizing of Franklin because he himself participated in a little bit of that, right? So he famously wrote an autobiography and so we get to see Franklin through the lens that he creates for uh, himself and his story. And so how does he tell his own yeah, story? It's, well, it's, um, uh, historians have to be sort of on guard for this because when you're writing an autobiography, you're filtering through the parts of your story that you would like future generations to, you know, to, to learn about right. and to know. And so, um, you know, there's, there's passages in the autobiography that uh, concern historians because it just it, it almost looks like he's winking his eye or he's kind of like playing a little bit. Um, he's a very playful writer. You also said that he's very funny, that he's very, very humor. Yeah, very, very you know, good sense of humor. Uh -huh. And so um, the autobiography is a sort of the f maybe the first stage of myth-making about Franklin. And then, of course, this is going to uh, become more and more exaggerated mm -hmm. in the 19th and 20th mm -hmm. century. So what are the key, th I mean, the key um, elements or things that from his autobiography yeah. that you think um, are, because one of the things I was surprised is that he really did not have any formal education, mm -hmm. and he did not go to college, and he really prided himself on being a very practical man, and that he thought that a lot of his inventions and creations and things were to solve practical problems, which I thought was really sort of interesting. So mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that in, in the context and how you um, sort of interpret that. Well, in terms of his uh, uh, self-education, yeah, there's this, um, curious quality that he has of, of being a real kind of self-starter, a person with a lot of initiative. And you can kind of see that early on. He breaks his indenture, you know, he goes out, um, you know, on these uh, oceanic voyages without, you know, kind of <laughs> thinking through it, I guess we would say. And, um, uh, and so he is a beneficiary of a particular kind of, uh, what would you say, like social and cultural context that was permissive for this sort of thing to, to happen, right? The colonial world was a world that was, you know, uh, uh, connected mm -hmm. to, you know, a Africa through the right. tribal trade, the, to Europe, obviously, through um, these uh, transoceanic trade routes. And so, like, he's, um, he's kind of living at a time when uh, there's this sort of, like, um, wide array of, of, of new stimuli. Okay. Yeah, and so the self-education is interesting. He, he's able to sort of tap into some of the, um, you know, sort of avant-garde literature of the era because of, you know, his interest in, in um, or his, uh, his kind of profession in the print trades. But then also he spent some time in London. This is the center of intellectual activity in the Atlantic world, right? And so he's able to kind of see what the, uh, you know, latest and greatest right. writers are, are doing, right? And so this is a, um, 
uh, a really key factor in um, you know kind of his intellectual development and, and personal and moral development. Too. He also he really relied on reading. I mean, he was mm -hmm. a voracious reader. And actually, it's interesting because you sort of see he was um, one of the sort of founders of libraries. Mm -hmm. But it was really because he, because books came over during the colonial time, and but they were very expensive and mostly you know white men. Yeah. But so he had a debate society. Um, the junta and mm -hmm. so he wanted them to be educated to be able to debate so that's where they started lending each other books and but he really valued uh, the really self-education and what you can take from books i don't have any question about that uh, and i think all of these things are sort of connected i mean he wanted to be thought of as an articulate speaker he wanted to be thought of as a well-read person he wanted to be thought of as a great writer as well mm -hmm. so he he practiced, uh, he read voraciously, and he practiced for hours and hours and hours to get his, um, you know, tone mm -hmm. and his uh, style of argument mm -hmm. just right in his essays. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what the junto was about, it was really uh, iron sharpening iron. Mm -hmm. You know, people, uh, young men on the make, mm -hmm. uh, young men who wanted to put, you know, put their mark in the world, mm -hmm. and they, they, they wanted to improve. And so there's this culture of kind of self-improvement that mm -hmm. sort of develops within the junto. And um, these guys, uh, you know, really uh, support one another, I suppose, in this in this attainment of a certain level of, um, you know, competency mm -hmm. in uh, in these kind of like emerging fields right. of inquiry. Yeah. How did he get involved in um, the formation of the United States? So, um, and where did that come? Because he's the only founding father that was um, signed all four documents mm -hmm. that helped to create the United States. So obviously the Declaration of Independence, the Treaty of uh, Alliance, um, the uh, the one, uh, the amenity and commerce with France. Yes. And the Treaty of Peace with uh, Great Britain, right? Yeah. And, and then the Constitution. So, and he even helped yeah. to write parts of the Declaration yeah. of Independence and the Constitution. How did he, I mean, because, you know, it's sort of, He's all these things because he also, you know, he supposedly uh, with the electric rod and the printing press. And how did he tell me a little bit about his background of how he got to sure. being so associated and entrenched with the founding of the United States? Uh, how much time do you? Right. Okay. <laughs> well, we don't have that much time, but you know, I, I do have a few things that I think that would be helpful. Uh, so you have to know that um, Franklin kind of struck gold with his printing press in Philadelphia, right? The time was right for an explosion But he was But he wasn't born here, right? So did he? He was born in Boston. Oh, so he was born here. So was he one of the first generations that were born um, in the? Uh, yeah, so uh, he was um, kind of from a Puritan background. So okay. like his, his colonial ancestry goes back to okay. You know, probably the mid-seventeenth century okay. in, in the in the Puritan colonies. Okay. But um, with this kind of like trade that I was describing, the circulation of goods and people and ideas around the Atlantic world. I mean, Benjamin Franklin started this printing press and and began the Pennsylvania Gazette and then started um, <coughs> uh, circulating that newspaper. He would get advertisements, obviously, uh, from these merchants who were sort of building their businesses and. He managed to get fabulously wealthy by the time he was, you know, a relatively young man, like in his early 40s. And so he was essentially kind of retired from that and be devoted himself to public life. He had uh, already gotten involved in um, some s civic improvement projects in Philadelphia. And uh, it was his idea to sort of go forward and, you know, begin to build that uh, civic kind mm -hmm. of infrastructure in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. He gets involved in the library, as you mentioned. Um, uh, he and some associators build a, a, the Pennsylvania Hospital. Right. They build the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, but a lot of other uh, just kind of municipal services that mm -hmm. we just take for granted today, mm -hmm. these didn't exist um, when he arrived in Philadelphia. Well, did, wasn't he like the first postmaster general? Yeah. Um, and, and he gets to those positions by really um, practicing you know, this kind of like civic activism of pulling people together. We really need to kind of figure out how to keep the streets clean, so let's build a voluntary association and we'll kind of like divide labor. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he goes through this process and it kind of qualifies him, if you will, for provincial leadership. So he gets elected to the Pennsylvania Assembly, he shows his worth there, and then Pennsylvania, um, you know, needs to have 
somebody go to England mm -hmm. to negotiate with the proprietor, mm -hmm. you know, because there's a breakdown in their relations between the colonists on the one hand and Pennsylvania's proprietor. So he becomes a, a kind of a fixer. Mm -hmm. I, it's probably the best word, you mm -hmm. know. Like he wasn't a kind of politician that loved to, you know, give these kind of florid speeches, and mm -hmm. he certainly wasn't an ideologue, you know, that was going to mm -hmm. push, you know, the, the Quaker principles right. over and against. He said he was kind of like, okay, we had this problem between the colonists and the proprietor. Right. I think it can be fixed. Why don't I go? You know, we'll negotiate some terms, and we'll move. We'll move on from here. Well, that's know? sort of like his pragmatism. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. and that's really where a lot of his inventions come from, right? Yeah. So the Franklin stove, the bifocal, right? Yeah. Uh, an harmonica, which is a glass mm -hmm. instrument, the rocking chair, a catheter. <laughs> uh, some of them you're not sure. Like when they said that he discovered the Gulf Stream, I was like. Okay, is that really true <laughs> or not? Like, because there are a lot of myths and things associated right. with him. But, um, but he did do uh, the lending library, the lightning rod, and then they said even swim fins. You know, <laughs> I'm like, so, I mean. What he, didn't he invent? That's right, funny. exactly. Um, and they said the American penny. Did he invent the American penny? I couldn't tell you that. I didn't come across that in my research. So it's like you program. don't know yeah. if it's the yeah. myth or the man, but the, but he was very much a pragmatist. Well, can, can I talk about that for just a minute? Yeah. So, so I think he really wanted his work in the community to be useful. We're going to figure out a cleaning street. We're going to figure out how to like uh, get this you know fire company wired right so it's not screwing up, you know. We don't have a militia, so we're exposed to pirates. How do we fix that? The Quakers don't want to empower, don't want to make this happen, so I'll fix it, you know. And um, this is true in the science realm as well. Now, he starts out as a, as kind of a, well, he's a printer, so he's like constantly tinkering. So I think that that comes along in, in his uh, biography, you know, from really from an early, an early stage, but he also, now that he's kind of like in retirement, just throws himself into like pretty dense, like theoretical material involving like electricity, how does it work, what are its basic properties and principles. And so he sets himself up like a like a Galileo or well, he's a Newton. Almost, he's almost and, like a practical philosopher. Yeah, and he, he actually tinkers with some um, machinery that helps him to go from that practical level where he like makes some devices that are help people to a truly kind of penetrating, insightful model for understanding uh, the basic properties of electricity. This is what actually makes him famous in, you know, in the um, educated community mm -hmm. in the in the Enlightenment world. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, he gets medals. You know, he's celebrated in, in um, you know, foreign capitals. So, it, so the the myth of him it's going not, outside with the kite is not. Yeah, th there's some truth to that. Uh, it's a thin read you know, when you're really trying to look for documents. Uh, you really only find one account of it. It's his own account. So you have to handle that with a little bit of uh, caution, but there's some truth to that. Um, what I was going to get at is uh, is that there's this um, capacity about Benjamin Franklin as a kind of a scientist and an inventor that is sort of consistent with you know the kind of the way he approached a lot of other things in his life, like his uh, civic involvement, his political involvement. Um, he's actually sent over to England to negotiate with Parliament after um, 1765 when they enact the Stamp Act. It's like, this is a problem. We're sitting over here in the colonies whining about this. You know, Great Britain's doing what it's doing. And, 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 and so Franklin's like, okay, well, I'll accept this commission to go over there and sort this out. And he's able to get the Stamp Act repealed. Again, that's a, a big move, right, for the Parliament to sort of an act of taxation and, the and stamp revoke act, it. The Stamp Act was about taxation, yeah. right? So uh, he kind of appeared to a lot of other colonists as the sort of guy that has time on his hands, lots of money, probably some, especially after uh, his um, publications on electricity, has some renown in Europe, so people would kind of respect mm -hmm. him. He wouldn't be this boorish provincial that they can ignore. And so he develops this um, kind of stature, and I, I really feel like this goes really all the way back to the Junto. All those guys were trying to become gentlemen. They wanted to become men of worth, you mm -hmm. know, not just, um, uh, you know, they wanted to get rich, but they also wanted to become men of social worth. Mm -hmm. And this is how you did that in mm -hmm. the 18th century, is you demonstrated your worth by, you know, involving yourself in the community, um, by, you know, um, 
serving you know your community in the legislature that was kind of a recreation of status and then now he's elevated to you know really a kind of a national level we don't have a nation yet but you know he's recognized throughout the colonies as being the kind of person who you know can work through a bunch of like complicated issues and arrive at some kind of satisfying settlement you know not everybody's happy about it but this is you know right we're able to kind of move well on. he can really um sort of he studies intensely and then he sort of comes up with a workable solution and then builds consensus but he also was very had a very i think a scientific kind of mind of how he approached things because you know he he was willing to hear people and he was willing to accept that he could be wrong and change his mind because clearly we saw that with slavery and the rights of um african americans i mean he was a mm-hmm. very big I mean, he sort of, that was a change of mind, right? From, yeah. from really other people or reading or, um, do you think that he would have wanted to run for president? Do you think he would have wanted to be the founding um, president of the United States? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, I think so. I think he would have wanted other people to want him to be president, right? That, that, cause his reputation and his standing kind of meant a lot to him. It did. I mean, so mm-hmm. how he was perceived was important. Yeah, so the reason was, he didn't, run for president was because the it was 1789 um, when man by then. he was uh, <laughs> he died a year later yeah. um, at 17 and 84 so yeah. he just couldn't but um but do you think so was it important to him his reputation and it was if you look at the autobiography he addresses it to his son he writes his autobiography relatively later in life right so this is kind of the mature franklin reflecting on uh, you know his uh, past experiences and the beginning of the autobiography says that um, I, I have attained a certain um, uh, reputation in the world and a certain degree of uh, affluence and a certain degree of facility. And now I want you, he's talking to his son, right, to be able to um, attain the same things that I have because I, I feel like I've lived a complete life or a fulfilled life, mm-hmm. right? Well, he put that that reputation as one of the markers of a successful life. And in the 18th century context, that meant the kind of reputation you get when you've been um, elevated to you know, status or provincial assembly, or right. you've been asked by all the other colonial leaders to represent the colonies in London. You know. right? And so he's, I think he's sort of conscious of the fact that a successful American life looks like this. But he wasn't, but with his son then, because obviously, a lot of that wealth would be, you know, transferred to mm-hmm. his son. But he wasn't saying, because he worked for it all. Mm-hmm. I mean, he wasn't saying that it should be given to you. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think he, do you think that's also what he was saying to his son, that you need to, don't just think because you're getting a, it's not like you're getting a silver mm-hmm. spoon in your mouth, what, which he was, but that you have the importance of working towards these things and the achievement and striving to um, build your reputation. It's not just given to you. Do you think that was um, important? I think so. Um, uh, uh, William, this is written to William. He's um, kind of plucked from uh, relative youth and, and brought into the um, colonial government, right? So he gets the kind of advantages that one would get as a child of somebody with Benjamin Franklin's stature, right? So this was part of the social system of 18th century England, 18th century colonial America. Um, I don't. I don't know if Benjamin Franklin would have wanted William to kind of start, you know, from scratch because it, it's also a, a, a reflection on Benjamin Franklin that he can get his child appointed governor of you know New Jersey that mm-hmm. sort of thing. You know, it kind of like reflects mm-hmm. on his uh, reputation mm-hmm. and his stature. Mm-hmm. But he was a um, he felt that there were um, basic principles or basic truths that the poor needed to learn are the, maybe the, the people who, you know, were sort of interested in improving their, their stature. And so uh, really quite early on, he starts writing these aphorisms that show up in Poor Richard's Almanac about, you know, uh, early to bed, early to rise, right. you know, makes a man. And there, there's a whole bunch of them. You know. Right, a penny saved, a penny earned. Although that's, that's right. not what he actually said, though. <laughs> it was actually a penny saved is two pence clear. <laughs> but there seems to be a lot of things that are attributed to him that he really never said. So that's that mythology. But I'm curious to see, do you think that this idea of his reputation and what people thought of him could also be his Achilles heel? Because I would think that he achieved so much tangible. I mean, you could see what he invented and what he had impact on that. It wouldn't be as important. But did that, do you think, um, was like his fatal flaw or a flaw? 
I mean, are you talking about like vanity? Yeah, you know, or just really worrying about his obsession uh, with, obsession uh, with uh, his, yeah. yeah. But that's a really good question. Um, I'm not sure how I'd answer it really, you know, other than I know he, by the time he reached, you know, like in his 60s and 70s, he had his distract detractors, you know, people uh -huh. that felt that he was, you know, right. uh, of a certain kind of um, disposition mm -hmm. and, um, you know, maybe even, you know, Mm -hmm. To the point of, uh, of of hurting, you know, maybe some of his reputation with some, mm -hmm. uh, you know, communities right. in in, uh, in colonial America. So, how do you see that? What? Because when you, when we talk about certain things, I can see mm -hmm. how they sort of um, became part of the DNA and sort of what mm -hmm. we all believe. How do you see that um, who he was and what he did and these kinds of ideas that he had? How has that continued to perpetuate um, in our history and in our lives today? Well, I, I think of Franklin just sort of on the whole as a rather open-minded person, uh, a person who really enjoyed conversation, enjoyed uh, what in the 18th century they called sociability, right? This hanging out in taverns, going to salons, uh, organizing these literary clubs, you know, so they can exchange ideas. Um, and this, uh, I think, produced a certain, I don't know, like, lack of a better word would be like personality, somebody uh -huh. who was tolerant of others, who was curious, you know, somebody who, um, you know, would, um, you know, didn't have the sort of like persnicketiness, I suppose, of the, of the other sort of archetype in America, the Puritan archetype, right? Somebody who was, you know, a little bit more concerned about, again, we're talking about social boundaries right. earlier. Um, <clears throat> so Franklin was, an, like that at all, he sort of like lived his life uh, break, trying to break free of some of those constraints because he definitely was a Puritan. He came from a Puritan family, a Puritan ancestors. And it was kind of important to him to kind of start leaving behind some of these um, tendencies that you see among, you know, like the Presbyterians, et cetera, and so on. At the time, anyway, of being kind of really insistent that you believe this particular way or that you kind of like worship God in this particular way, that you go to church. And, you know, and like practice your Christianity this particular way. And he was like, yeah, you know, like at the, at the end of the day, we're all children of God. And, and if you look at the basic principles behind all these expressions of Christianity, there's a sort of, you know, oneness there that we're mm -hmm. missing. And um, even extended that to uh, interfaith relations, you know, too. And so um, I, I speak of this in terms of sort of a, like a kind of outlook that emerges from the mm -hmm. 18th century and, and I, you can see it in other places, but Franklin is really the, the apotheosis of that, mm -hmm. you know, the sort of the, the person we think mm -hmm. of most And how directly. has that infused our, pop co our mm -hmm. popular culture today, would you say? Well, I, I think Americans, when, when people from other countries look at Americans, they see a, a lot of Americans as pretty laid back, you know, pretty, um, you know, again, open-minded, mm -hmm. I think, generally mm -hmm. speaking. Mm -hmm. uh, again, we could talk about what's like in certain communities within the United States, but there's a sort of idea that mm -hmm. if you go to America, you know, these, these people are, you know, again, sort of open-minded, tolerant, and, and they, um, uh, you know, kind of reflect a certain, you know, sort of skepticism about, you know, boundary drawing mm -hmm. and... Uh, and then know. we emphasize education. I mean, we make public education and... Um, and do you think that also, like, so there's this thing, what they call, when I look, was doing research, the Ben Franklin close, which is about a pros and cons list. Have you hmm. heard this? Is that, I mean, I so they were saying, it. they called it the <laughs> Ben Franklin close, which is where you list, make a pros and cons. So, so I think that, like, I'm wondering if some of this is myth or reality that he is sort of, continues to be infused. And then another one they said was the Ben Franklin effect, which is this idea that he supposedly, asked an adversary to borrow a very uh, old book. And so, uh, so the idea was that, his, the belief was, and it's counterintuitive of logic, but if you ask someone a favor, mm -hmm. then they're more inclined to do you another favor. <laughs> and it also makes you realize by, you wouldn't ask a favor of someone you didn't like, so then it sort of changes your adversary. But also you have to ask, a, it has to be a very relevant, um, favor, like something that like sort of promotes their expertise or something. And they call that the Ben Franklin effect. And they say, like, if you want to be a more agreeable or likable person, um, you should do this. Have you heard that? I've never come across that. But uh, again, what I know about Franklin, especially in the political domain, um, 
it seems to make sense because he was very shrewd, very cunning, right. and he knew how to disarm opposition. Like he knew how to figure out, or he, fi he had figured out uh, what specific thing the opposition needed to have in this particular uh, scenario in order for them to agree to the eventual outcome. And, um, and so, I, I, yeah, I, I'd never come across that, but it sounds consistent with this but, sort of But why do you think, though, that then we, we sort of associate all of these things with Franklin? Um, you know, what is that about? Why, why is that? I mean, is it because... Well, uh, so I was going to talk a little bit about the, you know, the legacy of Franklin yeah. into the future, right? Okay. So um, every kid in public school in the uh, 1830s and 40s read Benjamin Franklin's autobiography. It was an assigned text, and you couldn't get away from it. Like, there was this idea that parents and teachers and local ministers wanted their children to read his story so they can kind of learn these values of thrift, of hard work, of, um, you know, kind of the... Listening to yeah, others, the, yeah, working the, to s solutions, being pragmatic, solve problems. The basic Franklin litany, right. you know. Right. Uh, so it was really about sort of values, and they, they wanted these kids to, to become, you know, little, you know, like like the Horatio Alger stories, like little self-made men who uh -huh. would then become, you know, rich right. and famous. And who and also happy. give back and yeah. have, you know, it's not just about collecting yeah. their own wealth and greed. And, I right. mean, if you think about the what Franklin wrote in, in the beginning of his autobiography to his son uh, about wanting his son to have reputation and felicity and affluence, that's just basically saying, I want you to be rich, successful, and or rich, famous, and happy, right? That's the American dream. I mean, that's basically why these immigrants come over to the United States. They're looking for this package of financial success, mm -hmm. you know, a, a degree of, you know, uh, a, a reputation. Like they want to get to a place where they're respected in their communities, mm -hmm. and of course, they want to be happy. I mean, mm -hmm. happiness is something that Benjamin Franklin, um, you know, kind of again uh, believed he possessed, and it was the choices he made in his life that brought him to that place. So I think that it's not hard to see the continuation of those mm -hmm. um, ideas. Uh, the American dream seems still, to me anyway, mm -hmm. to have these components, right? I want to get rich. I want to become famous. You know, all these YouTubers right. out there. That's all they and, want, I, right? and I want to be happy first and foremost, you know, right. with the idea that maybe being rich and famous will make you happy. But right. <laughs> Do you think that um, it's also popular because he is on the $100 bill? Because uh, that's considered, be. you know, like to get a hundred dollar bill. Yeah, and that's how did they choose him for the the hundred dollar bill? I have no idea. In fact, it's very interesting because uh, well, we don't get greenbacks until you know the Civil War era okay. after. So because um, most of them are presidents, right? I mean, the early ones. The early ones, yeah. yeah. And then Ben Franklin. Not a president. Right. So how <laughs> did, what's the? Well, you know, the he's the most illustrious American outside of that group of national leaders who mm -hmm. were elevated to the highest position. Uh, but um, I forgot what I was going to say. Uh, he um, wasn't particularly well liked by the politicians who took over the uh, national government after the Constitution went into effect, right? Uh, those men were mostly uh, federalists, uh, so they, they sort of argued for a strong national government. They wanted, um, and this gets really technical, but they argued with Franklin over the uh, structure of Congress. Mm -hmm. Franklin just wanted one chamber, you know, where everybody would mingle together, and mm -hmm. uh, it would be based on popular vote, you know, so the majority opinion in that well, we should have a popular vote, so he was right yeah. on that one. In that he didn't win that one. Yeah, in that chamber, well, right, we get bicameralism, which is a Senate with, you know, two votes from each state, and then you get a popular representation in the House. Mm -hmm. Well, they disagreed bitterly over this. And uh, Franklin, you know, sort of like was, his, his political ideas were rejected by the James Madisons, you know, the Alexander Hamiltons, like this is the rising generation, right? Franklin's definitely a mm -hmm. passing generation mm -hmm. that, whose ideas were formed in mm -hmm. the 1740s and 50s and 60s. Right. So how involved was he? Well, anyway, I was going to mention oh, that. It's sort of interesting that um, like very little was said about his death. Like they didn't have like a, a big ceremony to, you know, to kind of commemorate uh -huh. his life. Uh, so there was that kind of enmity, I suppose, between those Federalists and, and Benjamin Franklin, uh -huh. who they considered to be one of their opponents, like the Anti-Federalists. Uh -huh. So. And how was, but he was involved in the writing of the Constitution. So, what mm -hmm. kinds of, what parts of 
his ideals or yeah he was there and uh, he negotiated these things um, you know so you couldn't really put your finger on a line and say that's a Benjamin Franklin thing you know um, in fact I think it's fair to say that he was sort of sidelined in a lot of these uh, deliberations but at the end you know he he signed it right he wanted it to become our new national mm -hmm. government because he felt like this mm -hmm. is probably our best chance to survive as a republic mm -hmm. and in your you so you've really been teaching and studying his um, autobiography for over like 20 mm -hmm. plus years so in that what um, what do you think are some of the things that at the time they didn't accept but he clearly was right about like the popular vote is a big issue now what were some of the other things that you saw that he really that they wouldn't accept but would make sense that we see today or need today well I, I guess I would probably rephrase the question a little okay. bit and say like there were some things that he sort of got onto that eventually you know we as Americans you know came to terms with um, like you know the treatment of Native Americans uh, as you said like now, there was plenty of anti-slavery sentiment before Franklin. He was a slave owner. He had like five slaves over the course of his life. And so he's kind of, in some sense, a little bit late to the party, but he's sitting there you know, at, at these meetings ar around the founding time, like advocating for mm -hmm. you know, abolition of slavery, which is that's a pretty aggressive mm -hmm. position to take. And of mm -hmm. course, America will come along later and eventually accept some of these kind of uh, basic mm -hmm ideas about how to treat people, mm -hmm. what, what, a, what the nation should be doing vis-a-vis -vis these groups, um, like, again, the enslaved Africans or uh, Native Americans mm -hmm. who have been sort of pushed to the frontier. Mm -hmm. And in your study mm -hmm. of him, if you had to look at some of his characteristics and things that would help people today, like these, what yeah. would be some <laughs> of those that you think we should take away from him? Uh, well, I'm really glad you asked that question. That was the question I was hoping you would ask, because he... Again, he sort of pioneers this sort of outlook that I find really admirable, um, and it is uh, an outlook that is characterized by this kind of deep engagement with the culture around him, especially with um, the best ideas that are circulating at the time. Um, he was very suspicious of what he called superstition, you know, so we think of that today as like a conspiracy theory. Mm -hmm. he, he wouldn't accept it if it didn't have logic, you know, if it didn't have sort of a factual basis. Is that because of his science background I or so. interest in science? Well, and it's just pragmatism mm -hmm. as well, you know, I think mm -hmm. uh, we talked about this earlier in the discussion, like he was a tinkerer and he was a problem solver and he was like, you know, uh, this is how this works essentially, so mm -hmm. now you're telling me yada 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 over here you know he, didn't, he wouldn't hear it you know he was just a pretty practical man I think in many ways mm -hmm. um, he was insatiably curious again that's a quality that I admire and you know um, I think I see that in a lot of uh, Americans mm -hmm. as well you'd wish these things were mm -hmm. you know and I spoke earlier of being open-minded mm -hmm. you know, of, of, of mm -hmm. inviting people into conversation mm -hmm. and engaging in sociability mm -hmm. this was an ideal for the gentleman on the mm -hmm. make in the 1720s and mm -hmm. 30s, and he sort of embodies that for me. And um, those are the kinds of things that that I, you know, mm -hmm. I think constitute this kind of Franklin ideal mm -hmm. that uh, um, I, w I would recommend, you know, and, for And how all do you think us. if he, based on what you know and this background and his demeanor uh -huh. and approach, what do you think he would say if he saw everything that was going <laughs> on today uh, and certainly what's happened, um, certainly with the insurrection at the cap. I mean, what kind, What do you think his reaction would be? I, I, I'm pretty sure that he would find lots of things about America to admire, you know, because we are a, a clever, industrious people, and um, we've advanced the frontiers on a lot of different, you know, technology, science, et cetera, and so on. I think those are things that he would he would say, you know, are really the fruits of these mm -hmm. labors that he and the mm -hmm. founders, you know, um, engaged in. Uh, for you know for a couple of generations mm -hmm. um, you know I, I don't think it's much of a surprise uh, <laughs> that he would find like the way Congress works pretty abhorrent you know because it's just locked in this partisan was he was stasis. He into and he, it? he was the kind of guy who liked to see log jams get undone you know and it's like okay well the job of politics is to fix things it's not to posture, it's not to announce your agenda, it's not to you know, score points on, on your political opponents or adversaries, it's, it's to fix things. So if there's some things out there in the nation that aren't getting fixed, then he would probably go back to, well, let's look and see how Congress works. And, and obviously, I think it's not a, 
terrible, terribly great insight to say that our Congress is dysfunctional right. in the relationship between the presidency right. and the Congress. Do, was he part? Was he big for this two-party system? Was that one of his? Was he? Well, I don't think he didn't live to see you know the the true sort of expression okay. of what we would call federalists and anti and democratic republicans contending for office, but. Um, I will say that if you go back into the, the political um, writings of the 18th century, there's this perpetual uh, warning against what was called then factionalism. It was a warning against uh, groups of legislators getting into an assembly and then forming a kind of caucus, and they would sort of then push these other legislators into their own caucus, and then suddenly these become adversaries. And I don't think Franklin really appreciated the fact that factions can end up producing this, you know, like log jam right. in legislation. And um, this is why I was trying to tell the story a little bit of Franklin going to London and mm -hmm. saying, okay, we got this log jam in Pennsylvania. I, I kind of want to just work this out so we can move to the next thing that we have to deal with. And how did he do that? Well, uh, we covered some of this stuff. He was a pretty clever person, pretty cunning, very persuasive. Uh, I think people admired him for his logic mm -hmm. and his ability to kind of lay out these mm -hmm. issues. And by the time he's representing the American colonies to the British, he has this whole long track record of accomplishing, right. you know, compromises right. and um, bringing people together to kind of in a concerted effort to address some, you know, some threat or some mm -hmm. uh, issue. Do you think he also used humor to sort of soften? Oh, <laughs> I mean, I would think so. I mean, he was a uh, uh, really, really good in social settings. Mm -hmm. I mean, he had a high degree of social intelligence. We would say mm -hmm. now. I think mm -hmm. that's the word we would yeah. use. Yeah. Yeah. So if you were to look back into the past and find somebody that you know really embodies that in a, in a very, very early, mm -hmm. you know. Um, uh, sense right. it would it would probably be Franklin. So it sounds like that with his ability to problem solve, build mm -hmm. consensus, see where there are issues and sort of work around, mm -hmm. his um, the idea of um, you know uh, being more uh, involved and engaged and um, that he would really be someone that we could use today. I mean he seems that he would really still remain very relevant and someone that we should look to today. Would you agree with that? I think so. This is partly what got me interested in doing uh, Franklin as a subject for this program, right, is um, what can we, you know, look back uh, through the last century as identify in Benjamin Franklin that, you know, either tell us about ourselves a little bit mm -hmm. or might inspire us mm -hmm. to be better versions of ourselves. Mm -hmm. So what would you say are some of those, without giving away the 10-part series, <laughs> what would you say are some of those things that you really think that um, directly correlate to who we are and um, who we, and also it's sort of ironic that we're looking back at history yeah. with him to see our future. Yeah. So how would you, how would you uh, encapsulate um, that? I, again, I th I, there are exceptions to this, but I think there's a norm in, in the United States of um, what kind of religion scholars call latitudinarianism, which is like, okay, you do your thing and your temple of worship and right. I'll do my thing and my temple of worship. As long as you're not hurting anybody else. That's right. And then Monday through Friday, we can have commerce. You know, we can go hang out at the tavern. We don't have to have these religious differences mm -hmm. dividing us. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think there's a sort of public culture in the United States of that. Now, again, privately, you know, we're still kind of in our churches, you know, right. talking about those evil right. people who are, <laughs> right. you know. Right. But we don't really have, I mean, do we really have the separation of churches? I mean, you know, it says on our money and God we trust. And, mm -hmm. you know, they do say prayers, you know, in, before they, they do. You know, so do we really have that, or was he really, did he fought for even more of that division? Uh, I, I think that he was a, a fan of the emerging laws that were coming through at the state level. Mm -hmm. So the United States was formed, you know, like in the 1780s when the state started forming, and then they joined the Articles of Confederation government. Um, and like in Virginia, they had the Statute of Religious Freedom. Benjamin Franklin would have been a big fan of that, right? Which was um, these two institutions are going to be separate, right? So the church isn't going to receive, you know, financial support from the government to conduct its operations, right? Now, I, I think we've we've learned that there's still influence from uh, you know kind of religious-minded people mm -hmm. on public policy. Mm -hmm. 
But um, I think the founding fathers understood this in terms of institutions. Like we just have to sort of build a wall of separation between like government operations on one hand mm -hmm. and then what these religious organizations are doing on the other. Mm -hmm. So um, I think again, we sort of work out these religious freedom principles in practice. And of course, you know, occasionally end up with Supreme Court cases that have to, you mm -hmm. know, make calls about mm -hmm. uh, really divisive issues. And he was also, I mean, not only was he a, a printer, he mm -hmm. was also, I mean, he was a journalist in a, in a sense. He was uh -huh. a public. So how would he feel, do you think, about this whole idea of fake news and <laughs> the, you know, divisiveness or, or the lack of, I guess, respect or gravitas of, of journalism in the media? Um, how do you think he would res respond to that? Well, uh, a lot of Franklin's, uh, m like some of the material that's in the Pennsylvania Gazette or in the Poor Richard's Almanac, is what I would call satire. I mean, this, th these aren't news items, right? This is just an attempt to sort of poke fun at a politician or like a minister that might have traveled through the region. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So he would probably have fun with some of it, you know, but he would he, he might watch uh, like The Daily Show or something like that and find that really funny. Right, because that's more satire, but that's it's right. based but, on... But then I think he would probably be disappointed to see, you know, some of this... Uh, I would call it media sludge, sort mm -hmm. of showing up in allegedly respectable mm -hmm. news outlets, right, because it sort of compromises our mm -hmm. search for facts mm -hmm. and our search for truth. Do you think that he would, he would like or be happy with the, the, where we are today? You know, sort of like what we did with what he was involved in creating, you know? Or do you think he would think that we sort of messed up and pandered it and, you know? Don't uh, appreciate it. I, I don't see any reason why he would, his general judgment, you know, again, some specific things mm -hmm. about American society and culture he would, and politics he mm -hmm. would object to. Mm -hmm. But on balance, I mean, America has, you know, grown mm -hmm. exponentially. It's, <coughs> you know, one of the richest economies in the world. I mm -hmm. think he would appreciate that. He was kind of an economist as well, studied that stuff. Um, and uh, for most of our history, the United States has sort of enjoyed mm -hmm. a prestige among nations mm -hmm. and all these these founding fathers were really concerned that the republic they were building would one day take its place among like the great powers mm -hmm. of Europe at the time. Those were like Great Britain, mm -hmm. you know, and um, Austria. Mm -hmm. You know, they wanted the United States to mm -hmm. sort of take its place, and I think it has. Right? I think mm -hmm. largely has. And do you think that um, because a lot of what you do is you look at you know the <coughs> world in the rearview mirror, but you can't not evaluate or, or think about it within the context of today. In your continued study and interest in Franklin and in the world in which we live in and how you know yeah. morals and values change, has anything about your perception or understanding or things that you liked about him changed um, over time? Uh, yeah, this is a really good question, Sarah. I mean, <laughs> I would say I was probably disposed to not like him very much when I first started. And the older that I get myself, and I realize that's not a big thing, you know, or mm -hmm. you know, just let bygones be bygones. Mm -hmm. I get sort of more like that in my own personal life. So like you're I saying that you, you came to like him more? Yeah, I start to see more of like that in Franklin because maybe I'm looking for it a little bit, but also I, I think he truly was a person who you know, like to get along with people. And he, um, he really felt that like, you could do very, very specific things to improve your community mm -hmm. and your province. Mm -hmm. and, and you should be doing those things mm -hmm. as a matter of almost, you know, um, moral obligation right. perhaps. And th these are things that again, maybe the older that I get, mm -hmm. that I appreciate more mm -hmm. and more. And so I see him in a, in a, a little bit more complex mm -hmm. figure mm -hmm. than I did when I first encountered him like in graduate school. When I, because that's like found a myself, life experience. Yeah, I found myself not really liking him. I thought he was kind of an arrogant, you know, mm -hmm. guy. And but yet you chose <laughs> to study him. Well, he's part of the curriculum that I teach. Okay. And then, of course, I did this program right. because, um, again, uh, as I'm aging, um, I, I find these engagements with these personalities in the past uh, uh -huh. like a lot more rewarding, you know, and huh. more uh, interesting to me. So, so it does go to that point that um, sort of where we started with this idea mm -hmm. of you can't, we can't change the history, but in some ways you can reevaluate how you interpret it, right? Or, mm -hmm. how, or how you see or understand 
what they did or in the context in which they did it. Do you think that that then changes the idea of history? Because then it's not only keeping the facts. I mean, it's the interpretation yeah. of those facts. Well, uh, can I kind of give you an analogy that I do with my students? Uh, we used to believe that like a historical subject would be out here in space and we would direct our attention to him and like almost like a camera, you know, and we would take a picture and then that would be this subject, this historical subject, Abraham Lincoln is this, right. right? And you're taking it from one perspective. Well, the historical professions developed in the 20th century and the 21st century, much more complex and more nuanced approaches to understanding mm -hmm. the past. And so it's, it's rather now like um, filming a, a, a movie, right? Mm -hmm. So you have, you have these two actors that mm -hmm. are interacting. Well, you want a camera here mm -hmm. And you want a camera here so you mm -hmm. can see their faces, right? right. You can do cuts and maybe over, you know, so that you end up with multiple perspectives, right. uh, and and you get this kind of much more holistic, 360 degree view of the person. Okay. So some of the things that I didn't really appreciate about Franklin were because I was just looking at him as an arrogant, you know, kind of ambitious mm -hmm. person, and then now that I've opened up my, you know my vision a little right. bit, and I can see, uh, you know, kind of other things about his personality, okay. about his character, about his life story right. that I I actually kind of admire. Mm -hmm. I, I hope that helps. Yeah, but do you think that, I mean, then how do we define this idea of historical fact? Because now we're muddying the waters with all these perspectives. Yeah. And so how do we define now history in that sense? And, and yeah. what is a fact now? Well, there are, the facts about Benjamin Franklin will always be the facts. Those are in the archive, right? right? So, um, you but can those go, are also very flat. I mean, it's the date yep. he was born, the date he invented That's something. Right. I mean, it's I can not write a, I can write what I would call a, um, a chronicle of right. his life, and it right. wouldn't be interesting. Yeah, right. but if we were to take some of those facts and turn them over a few times and ask some questions about them, then suddenly we're having a conversation about American identity, mm -hmm. about the. You know that maybe the challenges that Franklin overcame mm -hmm. that made him a certain kind mm -hmm. of person, and you know, or, or this kind of person, and not that kind mm -hmm. of person. So we're evaluating his choices right. and how they affected him. Right. That makes sense, yeah. and that's where the fun of history is. So you know, has that changed this idea? Has it changed the way you teach history and the types of materials and sources you bring into your classroom? Uh, I think so, yeah, because um, it used to be the case when I first sort of came into the profession that when you went to teach, say, a survey course in Western civilization or United States history, then this was the textbook you used. And it was like the voice of God. Like, this is the stuff that happened and that matters, right. right? And so you would read it. And now I'm less excited about this one historian's way of organizing the story. Mm -hmm. And and so with my students, I'll bring in lots of different kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Like, just the other day, we watched uh, Bare Knees, which is a silent movie about the flappers and the scandal that they produced when they uh, started, you know, changing their right. dress styles and it became right. flirtatious and stuff right. like that. It's, it's kind of a funny movie, actually. <laughs> but we were, you know, we were using that as a text. I said, I want you to read this as a text from the 20s about cultural standards and how they're being, you know, abrogated by this rising generation of women, right, who are kind of a little bit more, um, you know, sex forward. A little well, it more. had to do a lot, tremendous to do with yeah. the suffragettes, I mean, and earning right. the right to vote. I mean, that just empowered women That's across right. the board in so many ways. But these younger women were felt freer uh, to sort of express their sexuality. Right, well they weren't right. gonna wear all those corsets <laughs> and bustles and you know. Long sleeves, right. And it's like in the 60s when women burned their bras, but. So, so but my question, going back to the question about facts, like what is Berenice? Is that a fact? I mean, there's a film that was made in 28 that reflects the vision of the filmmaker about these cultural standards. He's clearly like making fun of them, mm -hmm. these prudish women who come from the Victorian mm -hmm. era and they, mm -hmm. They're scandalized right. by this woman who shows right. up in a short skirt, right, or a short dress. Um, but I think that conversation I have with my students about gender, gender identity, changing gender norms, what the mm -hmm. what the twenties represented mm -hmm. in terms of these culture wars. Because mm -hmm. remember, that was the period of Scopes Monkey Trial and right. Evolution, Prohibition. Uh, jazz is developing, and so there's just all this kind of like Amer urban, America isn't America anymore. You know, right. we're losing right. America, and and so these tradition-minded people are all pushing back at these. I think that's an important story of the 20s, right? But it's more interesting to look at a movie and talk about it as opposed to just, let's look at these facts, you know, and just lay out the chronology. So it's really becoming even more and more important the 
looking at history within context. Would you say that's the... Well, uh, we will always have our changing context. So uh, if my son became a professional historian and he's starting to do his thing 30 years from now, like our context will change into right. his context. And so they're going to have new questions and new uh, methodologies right. to look at the past than I have. But do you think that there's also, just like there is with how people interpret, you know, the, the Constitution, there are those that are literal, that uh -huh. what it says and we have to interpret it versus it's a more fluid yep. document that needs to be reflect the times. Do you think that that's also how there's, are there two groups or how we have to look at history in that sense that it's, yeah. that it is more? There are definitely schools of interpretation in, uh, in the profession, like this academic history, uh -huh. right? So um, there are those who are what I would call more tradition-minded and uh, more orthodox, and, the, and then there are those who are a little more avant-garde and mm -hmm. they want to sort of bring in theory. Mm -hmm. they wanna, I mean, this isn't kind of in the news, right, over the last couple of months, critical race theory. Right. I mean, there are people that want to bring that in and, and say this is a, a new way to ask questions about this old set of data that's been sitting there in the archives for hundreds of years. And it's been written about by others, mm -hmm. but you know, maybe we can kind of get a new angle on it. Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, it's so interesting how we really <laughs> look at our past for our future. And as you know, um, at the end of each show, I ask uh, the guests questions okay. by French novelist Marcel Proust, but you've already answered the first set that everybody gets. So now you're on the second Wait, set. Wait, is that the easy set? No, no, this is actually, I actually think the second oh, set, that the way I organized them, I actually think this is uh, much more uh, reflective of showing who you are, but uh, they're really different types of questions. So what is your idea of perfect happiness? Um, I would say uh, Probably family and faith, and just that sense of satisfaction of uh, of doing a job really well. And what is your greatest fear? Um, I would say uh, I I do fear um, like loss of loved ones, it's something that you know is just sort of always right there. And, you know. Which living person do you most admire? Uh, living. Um, I can't take a pass on any of these, right? Nope. <laughs> Several of my heroes, you know, have just died. So oh, who was who that? Well, like uh, RGB, you know. Uh -huh. uh, I was a big fan of John McCain. Uh -huh. and he had sort of like this political courage that uh -huh. I admired that I just don't see in Washington now. So, so um, we'll give you a little thank you. for that. <laughs> what is your greatest extravagance? Probably. Probably coffee. It costs a lot of money, and I drink a lot of it. So, what is your current state of mind? Uh, generally content, a little bit anxious, but uh, you know we have um, the semester in front of us and uh, grading chores and more classes to prepare. So, right, and yeah. and history constantly happens. So there's always more for you to do, right? I, I'm a, I'm constantly asked my opinion about things, and uh, right. I gotta be up on that stuff. So. On what occasion do you lie? What I what? Lie. On what occasion do you lie? Never. No. Okay. Um, Which words or phrases do you most overuse? Probably just some uh, exclamation like "That's amazing" or "That's brilliant." You know, I, I kind of try to encourage my students and use that kind of a lot. What talent would you most like to have? Uh, probably play the guitar like uh, really, really well. What is your most treasured possession? So it's got to be a thing, right? An object. However you define a possession. I have this piece of camping gear that I really like. And uh, if it ever got lost, I'd probably be just pretty distraught. <laughs> OK. But what kind of camping gear? Well, I have a lot of gear. I used to lead trips you know, uh -huh. out in the wilderness. and. Um, uh, it's just a uh, an old timey canteen with a bottle that sits in there with a strap, like you see from like, oh, the yeah. 1940s. Oh uh yeah. -huh. Okay. Yeah, I hunted that thing down and uh, paid some money for it, so I uh, I take it camping with me as my little talisman. <laughs> what do you most value in your friends? Um, probably availability and uh, sense of humor. What is your greatest regret? Um, pr 
probably moving um, away from family to pursue my professional uh, interests and my mm -hmm. professional goals. And if you were to die and come back as a person or thing, what would it be, or who would it be? Uh, it would probably want to be a person. I don't want to be a okay. thing. Um, and so, I. This is going to be super boring, but I, I can't imagine living a better life than what I'm living now. So you know, it's got its downsides and everything. But I, I don't envy a lot of other people and the lifestyles that they have, even if they're richer or more successful. You know. Well, I definitely think we will add an <laughs> exclamation point to that and say that's amazing. <laughs> Although that does get overused, at least in my... <laughs> no, but the idea that you're very content in the sense of contentment in your life. I'm going to put an exclamation point and say, Thank you. that's amazing. You can learn more about Ann Good Company and all the other great conversations we have had at anngoodcompany.info. You can also see part one of my conversation with Dr. Webb about Franklin Delano Roosevelt. We look forward to next week when we again invite you to enjoy a seat at the table for great conversation and good company.